Help. Oh, oh. Help. Humans, man. <laughs> hello, everybody. Hello. Frank just saying hello there. I was kind of hoping that would happen to Steven Seagal in this in, in this movie we're talking about today. What are we talking about today, Johnny? I'm glad you asked because we do have a hardcore special report. Excellent. Letting us know what this movie might be about. Letting us know the truth. Of course, the, uh, the hardcore special report is also on the same network as the Baba Joe show. So, oh, it is. Like giving it a little plug. Yeah, I, I, I love the screen grab. I definitely save this for a future, future use. <laughs> I'm definitely going to use this on other things. But yeah, we've, we've got some nice still images here that tell us we might be talking about the Warriors, but we're not, even though it might look like it. We might be talking about Robocop 2, but we've already done that. We've already talked about that movie, even though it seems seems a lot like it in this seed here. And it could be Moonraker based on these weird silver jumpsuits. I don't think it is. It could be Lethal Weapon, because there's a lot of Lethal Weapon DNA here. It's a Joel Silver producer and a couple of guys from the same movie. And Arnold's definitely not in it. And they had nothing to do with wanting more money or anything like that. It had nothing to do not with another off. another movie um, that was also a number two that yeah. happened to be being made around the same time. Yeah, it's, it's funny he never, um, of all the bloody sequels they've done now, that he's never done like a cameo or nothing. You know, it's, it's funny that he hasn't. But no, Predator 2. Very fun movie. Predator 2. Predator 2, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> it does feel like that. It's very, it's almost like a canon film in some ways, like the oh, completely over-the-top style and cartoonish violence like Robocop and that. And, Yes, we'll, we will have no Arnold Schwarzenegger returning for this or any sequel. <laughs> at least at the time of this recording. Um, but yeah, like you said, it's it's just too bad that at no point ever in any of the, the sequels has he ever even so much as made like a an incy-wincy cameo appearance, even yeah. just for like a couple of seconds of dialogue or, well, or something. But look, bad... I'm sure we'll... We got the bad cameo in uh, was it Terminator Resistance? Whichever one had Sam Worthington, that Australian guy who can't act his way out of a paperback. Um, in that movie, they used his likeness, but it was just CG on on like another T eight hundred in the future. So he gave permission for that. So that was almost a cameo, but it was just a weird, creepy computer version of him. Yeah, we don't even get some. Um you know some kind of cursory flashback or mm. any type of footage like is you know this this movie is is rife with opportunities to try and interject arnold in in some way but it does not happen yeah even, even on aliens you had like in the, the briefing with ripley we got to see some of the other cast on the screens not even that i mean obviously it would have been had to be paid for that even for a still image or whatever but i do think from from what i understand um maybe apart from money or contractual issues that the main kind of pull factor for for arnold not being attached to this movie is t2 t2 was in the midst of you know being made and produced around the same time as this and there was just they weren't going to get him on board for for predator 2 yeah but you do kind of have to wonder and i you could probably say this about a lot of kind of 90s era movies if they had just waited well, just james cameron okay. of the 90s it seems like he held up so many movies with his productions because people want to be in them if they just waited another year or two if they just said okay look we're gonna we're gonna leave this and we're gonna wait until arnold actually is free we're gonna pin him mm. down we're gonna get him yeah, to sign on. could have happened could have happened but it didn't happen but you know what in a way i am glad it didn't happen because it means we get to talk about Predator 2, the way it actually was made. And it is, it's one of those movies, I think it's an underrated sequel. I think it's a very strong yeah, sequel as far as these type of movies go. Um, in my eyes, at least, it's the best of the Predator sequels. Obviously, the, the first one will always be on yeah, a, I think so. a pedestal. <laughs> it's the lore of diminishing returns with a lot of these science fiction sequels. 
Um, you want to kick us off into the opening scenes here? I'm just going to tend to something for two seconds and I'll be back. Work away. I shall. I shall. So we open up with footage that's kind of flying over a lot of like foresty woodland. I think it's supposed to get us thinking about the environment from the, the first movie when they were in Valverde. But instead, as the camera um, pulls up, we see it's actually the outskirts of Los Angeles. And this is uh, the futuristic Los Angeles of 1997, uh, which is quite the year um, because I'm pretty sure Escape from New York uh, was set in 97 as well. Uh, must have been an awful year. I don't really remember it being that bad. I actually had a pretty good 1997, but you know, as according to the events depicted in this movie, 1997 was quite a bad year, uh, especially if you're living in, in Los Angeles. Yeah, it's got like a mix of the, um, I don't know, it's got the feel of the LA riot stuff and then mixed with like the violence of Robocop. <laughs> yeah, and and violence is, is one thing that this movie has in, in spades. So we we kick off, we get our, our opening titles, we get some brief moments of the Predator heat vision. It seems to be zooming in on this uh, battle going on on the streets below uh, between the cops and a, a gang. Massive, massive shootout. Ridiculously violent. We're seeing cops getting killed. We're seeing gang members getting killed. Uh, we have like a news crew on site that are um, kind of broadcasting live. It's hardcore uh, TV with uh, host Tony Pope. Uh, presenting live from from the the location and yeah we're just seeing chaos uh, erupt on the street uh, cars blowing up uh, cops being being shot and while all this is is going on um Tony Pope he's given us a rundown it's a city in chaos and uh, the cops have lost all control and as he's kind of uh, giving us this rundown he's almost hit by a car who's been driven by Danny Glover, who plays the role of Harrigan in, in this movie. He's making his grand entrance. He, he's driving in to, to help some some fallen comrades, some, some cops who've been injured. They're still alive. They're in the middle of the street. And Harrigan pulls up. He, he opens up the, the trunk of his car. He pulls out a couple of big guns and he, and he goes to work on the, on the gang members who are out in the street. And uh, we also we also see a uh, a couple of the other kind of main characters introduced here, which are uh, Harrigan's pop buddies. There is Danny, who's like his like kind of best bud, and then there is a lady cop whose name escapes me. Perhaps you can pull up like a cast list or character list. Yeah, or something. yeah. I, I usually know her name. It's like the three part name. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I know her her actress name is a long one as well. I can't think about she she's in the running man. I can tell you that much. That that much of my memory is working. So but, the uh, actress is Maria Conchita Alonso, that's her name, and she's Leona Cantrell. Leona, yes, that's right. That's right. So yeah, Danny and Leona are also introduced in these opening moments of, of chaos on the street. Everyone's and... arms with a taste on those openings like crazy. Oh yeah, these these gang members. So we are we are led to believe that these these are the the El Scorpio gang members. Um, basically, there's a big drug war going on in LA between two gangs. There's the King Willie's uh, kind of voodoo mafia, and there's the the Scorpios. So they're they're battling it out for control of the streets of LA. And Harrigan and his crew are just trying to do what tops do and bust these guys and and put an end to the to the crime wave that's that's plaguing the city but they really have their work uh cut out for them as this uh opening kind of um these opening moments demonstrate with with the big shootout but uh eventually harrigan he um he drives his car right up on top of the position of where the gang members are kind of planted and he kills a bunch of them while a few more of them flee into a building so this kind of sets up our 
are kind of opening uh, to the movie very well here because we established Harrigan as a bit of a badass. He might be a dirty he Harry's kind of trying to bust into an extremely dangerous environment. <laughs> oh yeah, and he's and he's definitely not a cop who's going to be, you know, restricted by the rule book in any way um, because he's pulled not to pursue the gang members into the building but he, he totally ignores those orders and him and uh, him and his two partners go in and you know they begin making their way up through this this building where the, the gang members have, have have kind of retreated into we also see briefly as well while the the kind of confrontation between Harrigan and the gang members is going on outside on the street that the predator is watching we see the predator vision once again uh looking down on harrigan yeah, i suppose one thing that um i was just going to say that that makes this movie mm -hmm. very different from the first one is this there is no real kind of long-winded kind of talky setup or anything you just yeah. it just kicks off straight away right into kind of violent heavy action and uh the it goes with the and the predators the, uh, we know very earlier there because of the thermal vision exactly there is no kind of tease so to speak we we know exactly what we're what we're dealing with here uh, in terms of the predator so it's a very different kind of opening and vibe to the to the first movie yeah and good good practical effects and stunts work in this opening scene too like so much happens in the first like 10 minutes just it's a real war zone of like explosions and gun battles and moving point to point like from cover and it's like just so full on I mean, look at this craziness. Wow. That's an amazing still. Poor, Herb, poor Herbie, man, got shot to pieces. Yeah. Got minced by gunfire. Yeah. Yeah, nice shot here of Aragon, Danny, and Leona. I'll try not to forget your yeah, name. Whenever again, I see this, this other duties, we've been so many, I mean, incredible amount of TVs and films. I always think of like medium now, like Patricia Arquette yeah yeah it's a it's actually great casting i know we were kind of um or at least i was opining a little bit at the beginning of arnold's not being in the movie but i'm glad we actually get the characters that we do get and harrigan you know danny glover he's a good lead guy um and he kind of proves in this movie that he can kind of you know he can carry his own when it comes to being like the leading man in a in an intense action flick he doesn't need mel gibson by his side uh you know yeah, like he's, he's, he's a special. great great actor i'm happy to watch him anything he said in interviews that like two of his all-time favorite films that like that he enjoyed working on were silverado and uh predator 2 just for being like really enjoyable and fun as you know good i'm glad he enjoyed making it because i enjoyed watching him uh, i haven't seen silverado i don't think but uh I watched Predator 2 many, many times. So I'm glad he actually enjoyed making it. Makes me like it a little bit more. But God, that scope on his pistol as well is pretty cool. I yeah, they all awesome. have it. it. Must be like their um their standard issue firearm for the the LA cops in '97. Yeah, well, it's that war zone thing too. It's like all the bad guys have got all these illegal military grade weapons, pretty much, and then the cops have having to kind of match up and get something so they don't get massacred. Speaking of massacred, there's the three gang members that Harrigan dispatched of. Uh, in I mixed up Ruben Blades with a different guy. I apologize for that. <laughs> well, look, I didn't know anyway. You could have just went along with it and I wouldn't have known any better. <laughs> oh, just, well, he's, Ruben Blades has been in a hell of a lot of stuff in the 80s. And the other guy I was thinking of, who's also been in a hell of a lot of stuff in the 80s, and I mixed him with another another actor who's been also a lot of like, you know, crime and cop stuff and things like that. Yeah, I love the uh, the aftermath of the carnage here as they're discussing pursuing the, the gang members inside the building, going against orders from downtown. The chief has said nobody is to enter the building until the feds arrive but Harrigan, he's like nah fuck the feds we're going in and i love the um long like we're seeing all this cool um stuff in the foreground here you know set dressing and the gang guys are dead and the, you got the cars but you can look down the whole street and see there's like um just guys everywhere and cars like the, the police cars have like blockaded the strip but you can see that whole street going right back it's like what an awesome 
shot and also just what awesome like um like set dressing style reminds me of, like those long shots and um like escape from new york and that where he first lands in the in the prison of new york and you see the long long street where there's just garbage and stuff everywhere fantastic uh, location shooting and for for anybody who's interested we we saw in one of the um you know the previous screens there the the hardcore logo but you can actually watch on YouTube the raw footage of all of this scene um, being filmed from the point of view of the hardcore television camera crew. And they really do shoot the entire street. And like as they're oh, cool. you know kind of moving down the street, you can see that there's action happening everywhere. And, li and like Johnny was saying, like they really like they blocked off this entire street and just created this chaotic scene that just it's just it's amazing yeah the location um shooting in this movie is is second to none it's it's really fantastic man we uh we got a great moment here um uh, inside the building where we we see the remaining scorpio uh gang members you know getting ready you know and uh when uh, two of the like two of the guys here by the way are actually in the first predator movie they're two of the rebel um guys oh, nice. that get killed at the beginning of the movie but they're back here again playing uh you know generic gang members and one of them takes a big he's like takes a big line of coke he's like scorpio <laughs> is ready you know while they're all loading up uh all their guns and and getting ready and just as they're all kind of coked up and ready to go the uh the glass above them smashes and we just see a brief glimpse of the invisible predator jumping down into the room Cuts back to the corridors and uh, Harrigan and his team, they're making their way up and they're, they're hearing all these screams and gang members like being killed and stuff. And next thing, uh, one of the Scorpio guys, he bursts out the door into the hallway. He's got his two Uzis. He's just running and shooting and screaming. He, he kills a couple of cops and he, and he runs up the stairs. Harrigan pursues him and uh, the guy, he runs up out onto the roof and he's acting all kind of bug-eyed and crazy and harrigan's got the gun on him he's like you know lapd freeze and the guy he kind of looks over harrigan's shoulder and once again he can see the kind of invisible shimmer of the predator so he opens fire and harrigan guns him down because he thinks he's opening fire on him and yeah <laughs> yeah this is another another moment of harrigan just being a badass yeah, most of the effects work is pretty good in the sort. I mean, all the practical effects look amazing, and some of the other stuff can be a little dodgy here and there. Like where, where you see the invisible predator for the first time in the still image, it looks really strange and not as good as the first film. But then later in this film, it looks a lot better when they're doing the same effect on a different background. Yeah, and I think at at this point in the in the technology that we're using for these effects, it. The background really did make a difference like obviously in the mm. in the first movie the jungle can kind of the wave any the waviness of the leaves and stuff kind of adds to the shimmer of the cloaking device yeah. and it just kind of it just hides it better whereas when you see it here against like a flat it's very open. background yeah it's kind of exposed it's just not and you can quite tell it's like someone's aggressive. tracing around an image on you know <laughs> although um Looks pretty good for the time, I have to say, even if a little. Oh, it's still a good it, effect. It just just compared to later in the film, it blends much more seamlessly. Whereas here, when I was watching, I was like, "Man, that really stands out compared to the other stuff." But the thermal vision so, looks uh, great. Oh, the thermal vision, yeah, and I always love the thermal vision effect. Uh, anytime I play like uh, as a predator in any of the AVP games, I always, you know, stick on my thermal vision before I go <laughs> on a on a hunting spree. But um, we see as well after um, Harrigan has gunned down the, the Scorpio gang member who takes a tumble off the roof. Uh, it's established also that Harrigan is afraid of heights. We see that Danny kind of has to go up onto the roof and calmly get him to come down. And he's kind of reassuring him, you know, and consoling him because, yeah, Harrigan just can't deal with heights at all. So. They go back downstairs they go into the building and they go into the room where the where we originally saw the the scorpio members kind of getting ready and, and loading up and they find a, a pretty grisly scene of you know bodies drung up and all the scorpio gang members are dead and they're kind of left the cops are left scratching their heads because they 
you know, they couldn't see anybody come in or out of the building. Someone seems to have gotten into the room, killed everybody within a couple of minutes and managed to, to string them up as well, all without the cops seeing anybody enter or leave the building. So that's a bit of a head scratcher for them. And uh, as they're as they're leaving uh, the building, Harrigan is confronted by his his boss, essentially, who's played by Robert Davi, who we've seen yes. in the likes of <laughs> Die Hard and Raw Deal and I, I, I so love many him other this, movies. Um, seen here because it's like um, he comes in, you can see he's wearing a badge, you can see he's part of like law enforcement, so it's like meant to be the force of good and order and the chaos, but. How is he dressed? He's dressed all in black, just like if you've seen Robert Mitchell with a Western, he's the sheriff. But if he's all in black, he's not not going to be a good guy, is he? <laughs> yeah, and you know, he's uh, his law and order is bureaucracy. That's it. It's all like you have to do things by the book. You know, how's this all going to look? And you're, you know, it's all that type of you know mindset when it comes to policing. Whereas Harrigan's just, uh, well, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get the job <laughs> done. Type of guy, you know. Fuck it, if I have to kill a load of guys and blow up a building, <laughs> not what has to be done, then that's going to be done. It's like, look, it's like, I'm just like, look, I watched all the dead, all the Jerry Harry movies. <laughs> that's how I work. Yeah, I know what I'm doing. You know, I can, I got this cop shit under control. We and, do and also see the urban, urban jungle war zone here. And like, realistically, if you're going to survive, you can't be up by the book person. You're going to be dead in a week. Oh, yeah. Like, and, you know, this, it, it, you know, the even from these kind of brief moments at the beginning of the the movie, like we do get the the impression kind of hammered home that the city is in a complete state with what's going on with these gangs. Uh, you know, cops being killed, civilians being killed, gang members being killed by rival gang members, and uh, you know, it's just it's just a crazy, you know, ultra violent, ultra violent situation. And add in on top of that that it's supposed to be unnaturally hot uh, weather as well, so. It doesn't help. We've got a city sweltering in in blood and violence. Uh, we we do see for a moment here as well, just a very brief moment um, when Harrigan has been cooled off. We see a helicopter land and a lot of very kind of official-looking kind of Secret Service type dudes um, kind of getting out of the helicopter and meeting up on the street and going into the crime scene, um, which is our first kind of glimpse at. Gary Busey's character, who's who's yeah. going to be playing a a pretty significant role in in this movie. So we um we cut to the um the cop station. And oh, old old police stations again. Oh. oh, big time! And this is you know you mentioned RoboCop earlier on. Like this is a cool Resident like Evil. RoboCop <laughs> style. Yeah, it's just you know crooks everywhere. It's packed to the gills. Really busy. People shouting. Looks like a horrible place to work. Everybody's sweating. <laughs> Uh, it's just it just looks nasty and um this is where we're introduced to uh to bill paxton's character as well he's going to be uh, uh, shown here for the first time uh you know in the in this cop station yeah and everything just uh everything just looks so hot and and horrible uh, they really they really pull off um you know uncomfortable sweltering heat in this movie like everybody's mm. sweating Everybody just looks wrecked, tired. Um, even the way it's lit, it's just like you can kind of feel the heat kind of almost emanating off the the screen. And so many of these these scenes, like I bet you the air in that cop station just stinks of sweat, <laughs> bo, and yeah, I can just imagine. Of course, we see um, we see Gary Busey here, um, whose name is Agent Keys. He's Peter Keys, I believe his name is. He's he's introduced he's got that hair. Himself. He's just uh, he looks like a lizard man or something. He's just like <laughs> he's so slimy looking. He is, and this is probably right. one of the movies where he looks a bit more normal than usual, and he yeah, still yeah. looks like I mean, a crazy it's, guy. It's it's just like he's a, um, you know, he it, it, he's often known for playing you know bad guys and nutty characters and that, but he's he's like he's like Patrick Bateman. He's just this suit and the hair. <laughs> So um, Agent Keys, he, he pretty much tells Harrigan, look, you know, I appreciate that you're a, a cop who likes to get things done, but my agency is going to be investigating all these gang-connected murders. So really, um, 
we're asking for your cooperation, but really what we want you to do is just take a back seat and just let us do all the, the leg work and more or less tell them just to back off and to let the, the special agents deal with all this stuff from now on. Yeah, so like every other episode of Miami Vice is like, this. It's like hey, yeah. you did the work, we're going to take the credit. So Harrigan, he's he's not too pleased about this. Um, and as he's mulling it over, he's actually introduced to uh, the Bills, Bill Paxton's character, who's who's Jerry, the, the Lone Ranger. He's transferred in from a, a different precinct. He's a bit of a reputation for being a bit of a a blowhard and, and not a team player. So Harrigan, he's not like overly chuffed with this guy being landed on his team. So he gives him a bit of a pep talk, but also kind of warns him about, you know, being a team player and making sure he's got the team's best interests at heart. And he welcomes him to the war that is the, the streets of LA. And uh, we are then west to, I believe, one of the Scorpio kind of gang leaders, Penthouse, and it's been broken into by members of the Jamaican Voodoo or Jamaican Voodoo Mafia, um, King Willie's gang. They've broken into the Scorpio guy's Penthouse. They've killed his guards, and now they're in the middle of. They're about to kill him in a kind of a ritual um, terror tactic killing. They're going to go through like a voodoo ceremony before cutting his heart out. Um, they do this all while his like naked girlfriend is like screaming on the floor. Um, so we've got all these like Jamaican guys standing around the the Scorpio guy. He's hung upside down, and they they throw all this like blood and stuff on him. And you know, uh, one of the voodoo guys, he's like, "This is voodoo magic, man." But you know what? I believe shit happens, and they're all just like <laughs> kind of laughing at this and uh, as they're all laughing we cut to one of them who's uh smoking a big blunt and uh he looks down at his hand and he can see the three dots of the the predator kind of um aiming device kind of going up goes to his head blows his head off and all of a sudden we realize that there's a predator in the room with all these gang members and he just starts killing everybody in in spectacular fashion like um we got to see a few a few new predator weapons used here so we he gets one guy, he shoots his net at him and sticks him to the wall. We see the net actually cuts through the skin and like bleeds you while you're impaled to the wall. He's got like a new, the Predator has like a spear that like extends. Yeah, it comes up a lot guys. of games and comics, the spear. He's got it like a kind of like a weird spear gun he uses as well. To, yeah, like, as now uh, his claws can fire guys. off like a, like a bloody toy biz toy from the 90s. Like, boom! That's all firing rocket so, uh, action. <laughs> Lots of lots of new gadgets that this predator is sporting um, compared to the one we met in the first movie. So he dispatches the um, the Jamaican gang members with ease. And the last guy he takes out, the guy who said shit happens, he's actually armed with uh, two gold pistols. So he must be really good at Call of Duty. But the, uh, <laughs> the predator takes him out um, fairly quickly as well. So that goes down. We quickly cut to the next moment of Harrigan and his crew showing up at the scene of this massacre. They're um, trying to get into the building, but once again, they're being told that it's uh, not their jurisdiction anymore, that the feds are handling these investigations and just a butt out. But of course, Harrigan being Harrigan, he goes on up there anyway, and he starts looking around and we see uh, we see a few of these hanging we once again get to see the, uh, <laughs> Jim the skin bodies, you know. So yeah, a couple, a couple of Jim Harpers hanging from the ceiling. They must and, get a lot know, of once... residuals out of these films, I guess. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and uh, you know, like Harrigan and the team, they're just like trying to work out what could have happened. It's it's a similar situation to what they encountered at the at the beginning of the movie, where an entire gang is, seems to have been taken out and skinned in very fast and efficient fashion but before they can really get a good look around and gather any evidence agent peter keys shows up and gives harrigan uh, you know a strong telling off and basically tells him just to get the fuck out of there that it's his investigation they also whisk away the the girlfriend of the scorpio gang member who'd witnessed the whole thing because they obviously want to interrogate her but they don't want harrigan's team to have any word with her so 
Harrigan, he's just really pissed off about this whole situation. So he does leave, but he asks his his buddy Danny to come back later on when the feds have gone and do his own bit of evidence gathering. Now he does um he does specify to Danny to wait until Harrigan also shows up later and they'll both go into the building together. But as we're going to see uh, momentarily, Danny does not follow this advice and instead goes investigating by himself, which in a horror movie never, ever, ever works <laughs> out well for anybody who's ever done it. You know, it just never works <laughs> out well. Do it. <laughs> When you take the initiative to do something by yourself, especially if you've been told that, no, don't go in there alone. If you go in there alone, something bad's going to happen. Definitely don't go in alone. It's not a good idea. <laughs> That's the yeah. guy getting the, I love the sparks and then the, like, the blood splatter behind him on that cold. Yeah, it's actually, it's it's one of my favorite moments in the, in the movie is this uh, massacre of the Jamaican gang members. The symbol effects, just like little fireworks type of sparkle things, you know, but it looks so cool. And here, look at, look, and the predator's still invisible. So, and then, but then this, obviously, the spear is not invisible. So, seeing the guy get skilled, it's like, what the hell? There was also a nice little callback during the gang massacre to the first movie because there's a brief moment yeah. where they're all kind of standing in a line and they're just shooting. They're just unloading all the clips, but instead of shooting yeah. up a jungle, they're they're shooting up an apartment, but it's very reminiscent mm. of that scene in the first movie where the, the guys are just shooting into the jungle. So, um, yeah, we see here Danny, he sneaks back into the building um, alone, like he was advised not to do. And he, he goes pilfering around and he finds um, what appears to be like a strange looking spearhead it's what we saw the predator shoot out of his gauntlet earlier to to skewer one of the gang members and just as he's going to to leave danny is sat upon by the predator and he meets his end now we never see exactly what does happen to him we only get to see that he's been um pulled up into a, a vent and we hear a couple of shots of his gun going off but we do see this the um the kind of Aztec style necklace he's been wearing so far throughout the film has been pulled off his neck. So that's going to um, be something to take a note of uh, later. Um, now that Danny has actually been killed off, it's probably a good time to mention that it feels like his character is almost an echo of the character of Billy from the first movie. So yeah. in the first movie you had Billy, who was almost this tracker guy who could like sense that there is something other than a human enemy that they were dealing with and the character of danny who's just met his, his demise here he was a little bit like billy too he was constantly kind of you know looking around and suspicious of things he was always kind of clutching this little necklace like like billy used to do in the in the first movie so there's definitely a kind of a character callback there even if he doesn't end up um you know surviving for much of the movie he's killed off pretty early but so um he gets got and all of we 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 find out that Harrigan's getting into a lot of trouble here because it's um you know it's kind of known that Harrigan kind of told them to to be there and Harrigan's superiors uh Robert Davi are are giving him awful guff about the death of a detective and Agent Keys is also kind of like well look you know back off stay out of this it's none of your concern. But Harrigan, you know, he's taking it personally now because one of his men has been killed. So there's no chance of him backing off. So basically, the remaining members of the team, Leona and Jerry, they're given assignments. Jerry's pretty much told to to keep tabs on Agent Keys and see what him and his, his team are up to. And uh, meanwhile, I think Leona is told to to go chat to the coroner and, and see if she can get any information about what happened to the, you know, just on, on like any evidence that they pulled from these bodies that have been found at these locations. Like that weird piece of metal, perhaps. <laughs> yes, exactly. A, a weird piece of metal that does not show up on anything that we've recorded on the periodic table. Yeah, they got the, um, what have they got? The, um, yeah, I think they've got a, yeah, here we go. <laughs> Recursive atomic analysis. So they're showing, they're looking at what, what it's made out of from the, you know, metal or metals. And it's like, well, we don't recognize this. It's probably not from Earth. <laughs> yeah. 
pretty sure I have an app on my phone that can do that exact same thing. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. So this, yeah, that that spearhead, the weird looking spearhead that was found has been examined and it's determined that it's not of this world. So um, Harrigan has arranged a meeting with the Jamaican voodoo posse's leader, Hing Willie. You think they watch the Ninja Turtles because they put their hats on. Like, as soon as you put their hat on, nobody knows who you are. Yeah, you're in disguise <laughs> mode now, guys. <laughs> disguise. So, uh, so Harrigan, he's picked up by uh, a car full of King Willie's goons. They're all smoking spliffs. They're having a great time. Even when the car pulls up, how do they say when they drive? Billowing it's just so much smoke in the car. And uh, when they drop uh, Harrigan off at the the meetup spot, I, even as he's getting out of the car, there's there's tons of smoke coming out, and he's coughing. He's like, "You guys really need to cut down." <laughs> so um, he goes to meet King Willie, and it's a very unusual place to meet like the top top boss of like a criminal gang. It's right in the middle of an alley, and yeah. Apart it's from the guys who dropped, him, <laughs> yeah, like the the guy. Apart from the guys who dropped off uh, Harrigan, like King Willie, he has no security or anything with him. He's literally just standing out in the middle of an alley. And you know, King Willie, um, we don't get to see too much of him in this movie, um, but he is a a really great character and very kind of memorable character. So he's he asks why Harrigan has wanted to meet him and. Harrigan basically lays it out. Look, there's there's somebody in town who's killed my people. He's also killed your people, and I'm su- I'm suspicious that you might know who it is that's doing all this killing. And you know, King Willie, he's a real kind of like voodoo priest type of character guy. And he's like, I don't know who he is, but I know where he is. He's from the other side, you know. And he starts um you know, getting out all these little bones and like throwing them on the can and he's like reading the bones and doing all this stuff and he's like, yeah, he's just like there's a there's a demon that, that's killing everybody and Harrigan's just kind of like, you know, what are you talking about? This is just, <laughs> you know, crazy talk. And um, he more, uh, more or less just kind of leaves um, with, with no real answers other than a load of uh, mumbo jumbo from, from King Willie, but as as Harrigan gets back into the into the car and and drives off, we see that that King Willie he stays behind in the alley and he's still kind of throwing his bones and and reading them and doing his voodoo things. When all of a sudden we see a uh, the invisible force drop down behind him, and the the predator lands in a puddle, and as he's Walking through the puddle, we got a nice visual effect where we can still kind of see that he's cloaked, but in the reflection of the puddle, you can actually see his full uh, physical form, which is kind of a pretty, a pretty cool optical effect. And uh, King Willie, you know, he draws a blade. He's ready to die, you know. Tell me now, Babylon, and uh, he gets beheaded <laughs> pretty quickly. He's dispatched yeah, of pretty quick. He's one. he's. Yeah, he doesn't last long at all. We see in that nice little still you have there on the on the bottom of the screen his head being carried uh, by the predator um to a trophy room where it's gonna be cleaned and the skull is gonna be shined up real nice to be put on a wall display that we'll get to see a bit properly later on and we'll get to find out a bit more as to where the, the predator is is keeping his, his trophies. So yeah, the the murder and mayhem continues. So we've had Danny Boy being killed. Now we've had uh, King Willie being murdered in the alley. So Tony Tony Pope's back with another hardcore special report. Uh, you know, talking about all the the murder and mayhem. Um, and look, you know what? God bless Tony Pope. You know, it's journalists like him that keep us the public um, aware of what's really going on. And you know, guys like Tony Pope, we. We definitely need them in society. They're they're upstanding citizens. You probably likes to smoke as much when those Jamaicans, I reckon. Yeah, just too bad they're smoking tobacco and, and not the other stuff. <laughs> Better for you. Yeah, I love this um, image here of the predator on that like old, um, old grotesque looking thing coming off the building because like that and other shots, you know where used in the, a lot of the promos and posters and video games the one where he's standing up and holding the 
skull and every time i think of predator 2 i always think, think of this like him standing on the building yeah it's, it's like a Batman it's a great there the night. <laughs> yeah it's awesome it's awesome i always love the tagline as well uh for this movie it's um he's in town with a few days to kill <laughs> great tagline great tagline yeah it's awesome and this is just that scene here it's the daylight but um no predators here, but just great looking um, street scene here. All the people and the shops. It feels very lived in, and you know, it doesn't feel. It's not like we're watching a soundstage movie. We're really outdoors, and you know. Awesome as well that they have the uh, taxi dermy uh, store there, and mm. that's the window that we see Harrigan looking in briefly, where he sees all these kind of stuffed animals and, and all, all the know, nice colors like this could easily be a skill still from staff scarface or something <laughs> oh yeah yeah you can feel that heat you know super mm. warm so uh yeah we um we cut back here to the lab that's been analyzing the the spearhead that was found and we we got that moment where the the good doctor um scientist lady explains that yes it contains no elements that can be found on earth she also mentions this while a lot of the evidence gathered from the crime scenes has been removed or destroyed by the special agents that there is still some records left on the computers that she's been able to find and one of the records indicates this um blood found on the bodies contained um high amounts of like animal proteins and steroids which leads mm. her to believe that the person um, committing the killings has recently been around a slaughterhouse. So that's one little bit of, of interesting uh, information that's learned. We also see here a moment as well with Danny Glover or Harrigan walking on the street. He looks in the window of the taxidermy store and sees all the stuffed animals. And it's his, um, maybe a little bit of a moment where he's kind of putting the, the dots or joining the dots together as to the fact he's dealing with a, a hunter. And yeah, it's a nice bit of foreshadowing thing the store. Definitely, definitely. And uh Harrigan, you know, he he makes his way to the, the cemetery where, where Danny has just been laid to rest. We we got a nice kind of moment where he's, you know, reminiscing with Danny, talking by his, his graveside. Uh we also see why this while this is going on, he's actually been watched by the predator. And while this is happening, a little child gets out of a car who, you know, his parents are going to visit a different grave and the child gets out of the car. He has a little toy plastic gun. And we see that the predator, upon spotting the child first, notices the gun and thinks it's a weapon. But then he kind of scans it and realizes it's, you know, just a toy. So he does not attack the child. And this I should have him working a... on a bloody border patrol then because he figured it out pretty quick to confiscate or destroy it. So, um... This is our first little bit of kind of, I suppose, a little bit of tibbish of the pers or personality traits of, of the Predator in this movie. So we see that he will not kill a child, which is which is something to take note of there. However, he does like fucking with his prey because as um, Harrigan is leaving the cemetery, um, he notices this Danny's necklace that was ripped from his neck when he was killed is just hanging off a tree <laughs> right in front of him so the predator is obviously <laughs> gone and just left it there um for for him to see so a uh, total mind fuck on on behalf of the predator um for harrigan he's just like pointing his gun right around the cemetery while the while the predator watches from a distance so we cut to another scene here now we're on the subway uh leona and jerry um they're making their way um you know, down through one of the carts, and they they come across a, a an incident where some kind of local thugs are harassing a man. They're they're trying to steal his suitcase, and the guy he actually pulls a gun on the gang members, but then the gang members pull out guns on him, and we think there's going to be a a big smudge because literally every passenger on the train uh, pulls yeah, out. Yeah, I love gun that scene and... where all the passengers pull out the guns. Feels like Robocop's Detroit again. It's like everyone's oh yeah. And this is just, you know, just to place more emphasis on the fact that crime is so bad in 1997 that literally everybody had to carry a gun for their <laughs> own protection. Of course, um, Jerry and Leona, they intervene. Uh, Jerry's like, you know, look, we don't want any rush hour Rambos here. And uh, 
he's trying to convince all the um the commuters to to lay their guns down uh, so they can deal with this in a in a calm manner and just as this is all going down there's a bang and we cut to the outside we see that the predator has landed on top of the the train he busts his way in uh, the lights go off and the predator um begins to massacre all the gang members and pretty much everybody else who's in the train cart anybody who's armed essentially um start getting taken out uh, by the predator and we see this scene of absolute chaos where it's switching between the kind of darkened cart but also the the predator heat vision and he's just taking guys out one by one by one and um you know so the situation's pretty dire uh, Jerry tells Leona to kind of herd the remaining passengers out of the car and, and up, you know, down the train away from what's going on. And he opts to to stay behind and, and fight the Predator. So, like, the Predator's making its way towards him. And Jerry, you know, he's unloading his pistol on him, runs out of ammo. It doesn't do anything. Finally, he uh, he takes out his little lucky his look lucky snooker ball or whatever that is he's been carrying with him for the movie and he just throws it at the predator which of course also does nothing and um all we do really hear is uh jerry scream we never fully get to see what happens to him we do briefly see that he picks up a machete that one of the gang members has dropped to try and defend himself but we never see how it all goes down but we do know that like you know he gets got uh essentially he he's done in so so poor Bill, Bill Paxton, he's he's killed off, and you know Bill Paxton, he's the only actor. Oh, man, movies, game over. So, yeah, game over, man. He's he's the only actor in movies to have been killed by a Terminator, an alien, and a predator. So he'll always and have that. I forget the other fella. <laughs> he'll always have that honor, you know. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so the the train has stopped. Someone pulls the emergency brake, and um, Leona, when she gets off, she goes back down. Um back down to see if Jerry is still alive and she is set upon by the predator and the predator he lifts her up by the neck and we think he is going to do her in because she is armed and it, and it would be the thing to do but um, we see through the predator's heat vision that Leona actually is pregnant and the predator lets her live so this is another instance of I suppose a code of honor being demonstrated by the predator he did not attack the child with the toy gun and he would not kill Leona because she's pregnant. So definitely we are fleshing out the the character of the of the predator in this movie. It's not just straight up, you know, oh well look, he's a hunter, he kills for sport. He does appear to also follow a code of honor. So it's kind of nice getting this type of stuff, you know, flashed out and, and learning a bit more about the Predator as an actual creature or, or character in its own right. And um, yeah, it's when really we cut cool back... Scene. Oh, it's a really cool scene. It's a really cool scene. I, um, I like how just um, mindly... poor passengers, <laughs> you just want to get on the train and commute and go home and it turns into the bloody midnight meat train. It's just a massacre. <laughs> yeah, a total massacre. A total massacre. And um, when the when the police chief is trying to like you know when Harrigan comes down to investigate what happened and the police chief's like oh you know I don't understand you know it was cops were killed gang members were killed and civilians were killed it doesn't make any sense Harrigan is pretty quick to put together the fact that they were all armed seems to be what they all have in common it's like everybody that was killed had a firearm so you know, he's definitely putting the Iggy together that, that this there's a, a hunting element to these killings. Mm. So um Harrigan, he goes investigating down the tunnel a bit, he finds the beheaded body of Jerry and he also catches a glimpse of the predator um escaping out uh, you know, a, a stairway or something like that. So he pursues the predator. There's a great moment where the predator is cloaked and he's like running across the roofs of cars and, and stepping on cars, denting in the roofs and stuff. These are great shots, by the way, the punks. Look at the face on that guy. Yeah. <laughs> for Jerry there. The Lone Ranger. He's about to, to meet his demise. Yeah, unfortunately. So. <laughs> 
And uh, yeah, that's probably a skull that we see here on the predator's back as he's, um, we get to see the predator yeah, climbing up the level. side of a building. And uh, one of the uh, the kind of promotional images Johnny mentioned earlier, we we see here as well the predator. He uh, he kind of holds his trophy skull in the air while while raising his his spear as as lightning strikes. It's a great um, it's a great visual. And uh, this whole time, of course, Hargan he's he's been pursuing the predator and he tracks him down to the slaughterhouse district. But just as he's getting close and he's about to, to enter the area that the predator has fled to. He's intercepted by Agent Keys' team, who ram his car, and they pretty much apprehend him, and they bring him into this control room. And it's explained to him exactly what's been going on. So first of all, Keys explains this: his team is like hunting this extraterrestrial life form. He says that they know it as a hunter, that it kills for sport. They make reference to the first movie where they say that in 1987 that one of its kind tracked and killed a, a special black ops unit in the Valverde jungle. So they've been watching this creature for a long time, or these creatures, I should say, because they believe that they're coming to Earth regularly um, when it's very hot and that they're hunting uh, humans. And, um, you know, Hargan's kind of like, you know, well, what's the deal? Like, do you admire the son of a bitch? Like, why do you want to... What do you want to do about us? And he's explains to them that basically they're looking for the predator technology that, you know, they know that it possesses literally futuristic out of this world technology and they want to get their hands on it. So their their plan is to to essentially capture the predator so they can like interrogate us and quiz it on its technological advancements. And we see that their their plan is because they believe that the predator can only see in one field of vision, they believe he can only see an infrared. So their plan is to kind of host it's the slaughterhouse. Suits. Yeah, they, they they put on these big gimpy moonraker suits and they, <laughs> like ten full they, suits. <laughs> they coat the interior of the of the slaughterhouse where all the meat is hanging um in a kind of weird like <clears throat> breeze powder. So it you know the predator supposedly won't be able to to see and they have uh, the team go in armed with these kind of like freeze guns that they're going to try and like essentially stun the predator, freeze it, capture it. They're, they're not trying to kill it. But this plan, it, it completely backfires on them because they they go into this this um, this slaughterhouse and they're all there waiting for the predator. The predator arrives and yes, he, he looks into the slaughterhouse and notices that he can't really see because his heat vision does not seem to be working. So he just makes an adjustment on the side of his helmet, <laughs> which switches. It shows him kind of switching through different kind of like visual bands until he finally gets the one that allows him to see through the kind of um, the freezy mist that the guys have, have planted in the in the slaughterhouse. And, and straight away, he's actually able to see where all the guys are. And it's funny because it, it, it makes me think of like Batman Arkham Asylum, like using that vision, like the Predator and and also, like they've got this freeze gun. <laughs> it's like almost a freeze boss battle. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant though, because he he absolutely um, massacres this this special squad that's been led by Gary Busey. Like he takes them out one by one. There's a lot more gushing and skewering and all sorts of nastiness going on. And all the while, um, Harrigan he's watching with the other special team members. They're watching in the control room and. He's like, fuck this, they're getting massacred. He manages to uh, disarm one of the guards and escape. He gets to go back to his car where he equips himself with some with some heavy artillery. So he, he gets himself um, some body armor, gets himself a nice shotgun, some pistols. He also pulls out um, the same gun that Arnold used in the first movie, you know, the kind of m16 with the underslung grenade launcher so yeah. he's ready to go into this slaughterhouse packing some some serious heat he's um he's ready to go up against the the predator and and do whatever needs to be needs to be done here yeah nice, well, nice interior lovely shot. consoles inside their little special ops van and i, I do like in this film that there's, there's so much action in this film that we get one of two things i love in a lot of 80s films we see lots of cool monitors and um phosphorescent screens 
but there's no phone acting in this film that I noted. Oh. Not a lot, because there's no too cool busy, night. too much action going on. We didn't have time for the phone acting, but we get some cool screens here showing of the, you know, the meat packing plant and that, and the sensors. More monitors. <laughs> and this feels like this could be like Escape from New York here, like the red. Oh, yeah. 100%. Like Lee Van Cleef is just off frame over there. <laughs> Great shot of the Predator there as he's watching uh, the team below in his in the meat factory or the, the slaughterhouse. Yeah, he's flicking through his, his vision sensor there just to find the right the, channel. It's so simple, but I just love it. I just love the colors and the you know, video monitor look. It's awesome. And a lot of video games that allow you to play as a predator will allow you to do the same thing where you can kind of switch your, mm. your field of vision depending on the type of environment that you're in. So you get a headache and then switch to another vision. <laughs> So uh so Harrigan he enters the slaughterhouse, he he comes by the predator who's just in the finishing moments of of mopping up the carnage he's after committing. Harrigan goes at him hell for leather. There's um there's a kind of a back and forth shootout, but but Harrigan he eventually gets to drop on the predator, um largely thanks to uh to Peter Keyes, who's <coughs> still alive um and tries to to take out the the predator one more time before he's swiftly beheaded by one of the predators kind of like razor frisbees or whatever the hell it is he likes to he likes to throw so um harrigan yeah he's able to get the drop in him he hits him numerous times at close range with a shotgun and we see like the that glowing green blood from the predator just like kind of bursting out of him as each of the each of the hits of the shotgun got him and you know the predator he collapses to the to the floor and harrigan uh, approaches and he realizes the predator's wearing a a mask so he takes the predator's mask off which i don't know why he felt the need to do but he's obviously <laughs> well, just curious do? um and we got we kind of got the first look at the the predator's the predator's face and you know, Harrigan, he, he goes to say Arnold's line from the first movie. He's about to say, you are one ugly mother, but he's cut off as the Predator awakens. He puts his hand around his throat and the Predator's like, motherfucker. <laughs> and uh, he throws Harrigan off him. And now there's another big um, cat and mouse chase as the um, the Predator and Harrigan kind of uh, pursue and, and battle each other outside of the building. And we got a pretty tense moment on a rooftop where both Harrigan and the Predator are at risk of, of falling. And the Predator actually thinks that his jig is up and that Harrigan has actually gotten the better of them because, you know, they're both dangling from the from the side of this building. So the Predator's like, oh, well, you know, fuck it. So he he actually opens up his, his wrist gauntlet and goes to do the the self-destruct sequence that we've seen in the first movie but harrigan through intuition or whatever seems to notice that something bad's about to happen so he actually uses the predator's own razor frisbee thing to slice his, the predator's yeah, hand like off the wall and he grabs it and slices his arm and uh predator he goes flying he is able to um to kind of stop his descent a bit by digging his his claw gauntlet into the wall to kind of slow himself down as he's falling. Um, meanwhile, the um the self destruct has been disengaged due to his arm being chopped off, and um, we get some nice moments here as as Harrigan is trying to like calmly get himself down off the building and and shimmy down on some pipe. We see that the the predator has falling through the wall of some poor old couple's uh, apartment and he yeah. goes into the back room and it's a little, little bit of a throwback to the to the first movie where we see how the, the predators treat themselves when they're injured some great stills here by the way that you're going through look at that face yeah Ray's brilliant just where he chops his arm off and see the top of his head so good and then awesome. yeah into the lady's apartment awesome. <laughs> poor lady yeah so the yeah the predators he's um He's smashing up tiles and he's smashing up the porcelain bath and stuff and he's he's grinding it all up into this powder that he's making into like a hot paste that he, he essentially burns onto his arm to seal the wound while roaring in agony. So he's doing a bit of a a kind of on the job field dressing here of his wounds and mm. he bursts through the poor lady's bathroom door 
just as Harrigan makes his way into the into the apartment and yeah it's a pretty funny moment where Harrigan's like trying to tell the woman to remain calm because he's a cop and the old lady's like I don't think he gives a shit you know in reference <laughs> to the predator That's right so um the pursuit of the predator um uh, continues with Harrigan kind of following it down a shaft which actually leads to like an underground tunnel beneath the building and in this tunnel is what appears to be an alien spacecraft so Harrigan very bravely enters the craft and he walks into this kind of red orange kind of misty area that you see here but he also comes across the predator trophy wall and on this wall we see many interesting things you know including human skulls which you'd expect to see from a from a predator hunting humans but we also see some weird like dinosaur looking skulls and strange alien skulls but we also see a xenomorph skull like an yeah, actual so alien studios. xenomorph skull and this is like the first kind of on-screen acknowledgement of the alien versus predator universe so depending on who you listen to and you know depending on what version of history you want to listen to like i have watched documentaries before where the fox studio people tried to say that this is something they came up with you know for this movie that's not true the the alien versus predator comic had already actually been released from from dark horse and hmm. uh Stephen Hopkins, the director of this film, has actually said in interviews that no, he was aware of the comic and he deliberately put the uh, the xenomorph skull in this film to acknowledge that comic. So at least at least we get to know that the director did have some background knowledge in the yeah. expanded universe as it was kind of going on, you know, at the time. And they're able to because they're both with Fox Studios. If it had been a different yes. studio, they couldn't have done it, or they might have got in trouble. But... but it's a really cool thing to um to see that xenomorph skull and just as we're kind of taking in that cool moment the the predator reappears he's not cloaked anymore you know he's armed just with his, his blades on his wrist gauntlet and harrigan's armed with the with the razor frisbee and they they have a duel essentially and it's a bit a bit of an even duel because the predator it has been wounded by the shotgun blast it has has one of its arms cut off so yeah. it's a bit more of an even fight and um as Hargan, he's kind of knocked to the ground and we think the Predator's finally going to get the kill on him. Um, and one kind of last act of desperation, Hargan um, reaches up and, and skewers the Predator right in the gut with the with the razor <laughs> frisbee. It's a pretty nasty yeah, death. Nasty. It, it looks, blood -like spray it looks very painful. Yeah, it looks extremely painful and, and not pleasant. And... and the way they shoot it from that top-down view there on that but on the left where you can see the blood coming out it's a really cool perspective awesome oh, this whole like um and i and i must apologize because i know i'm not really doing this whole moment just to say i would really recommend anybody who hasn't seen the movie yeah you, you need to watch even just for these moments within the predator ship it's very cool looking lots of cool visuals very smoky and misty just really um a really awesome uh environment that all this action has taken place and but um just as uh, as Danny Glover, he he finally kills Predator that's been hunting him, and we think he's he's out of the woods, so to speak. When all of a sudden, several Predators decloak and surround him, and uh, you know we get this kind of cool line from Danny Glover where he just kind of looks around. He's like, "Okay, who's next?" <laughs> uh, which I always thought was pretty funny, but in fact, the uh, the predators are are not in fact interesting in in killing Harrigan. Instead, they pick up the the corpse of their fallen comrades, and as they're leaving, one predator, the elder predator who is unmasked, he turns to to Harrigan, and he pulls out this old timey kind of pirate pistol. Yeah, like and a flintlock he, uh, or whatever. Yeah, an old flintlock pistol. And he, he throws it to, to Harrigan and he's like, take it, keep it. So it's almost like he's given Harrigan this reward for managing to, to kill one of their own, which is another pretty cool thing. Once again, when we're talking about the kind of code of honor among these creatures that like 
there's now been kind of three instances in the film where they could have easily taken advantage and killed somebody, but they didn't due to the actual circumstances that the that the person found themselves in. And in this case, they're actually rewarding Harrigan for being brave enough and gutsy enough to to kill one of their own. So Harrigan, he's he's left with this pistol. He has to jump off the ship as it's about to take off and he just barely manages to escape being kind of fried by the engines of the ship as it blasts its way out from under LA and, and back to the Predator homeworld. And we get this nice moment at the end where Danny Glover, he's covered in dust and shit and one of Agent Key's kind of special forces guys shows up and he's like, damn it, we were so close. You know, we nearly <laughs> had him and you know, Hargan's kind of like, don't worry, asshole, you'll get another chance, which is kind of <laughs> referencing the fact that they will come back to Earth and they they will hunt again. Um, yeah, look at that. <laughs> yeah, he looks he's, great. He's through the shit. <laughs> he looks like he's doing a bit of voodoo himself there. In, yeah, yeah, he's looking like covered in powder. And, but he just looks like such a wreck. <laughs> it's just great. You can tell he's just been through so much. Uh, this scene here, man, like, oh, it's such a great shot. One of my favorite predators actually is the uh, the elder predator from the end of this movie. I actually mm-hmm. have him in uh, yeah, hang on. boy oh, form here there. from NECA. Picked this one up a few years ago. Very cool. So the NECA box, they describe him, they just call him the elder predator. In, on the movie kind of script and production notes, they refer to him as the grayback. I believe is is what another name they give him, and also he was later renamed the the Golden Angel in the, in a kind of a prequel story that was done about him. And uh, we can see here in his hand, he actually has the pistol that he gives to uh, the Harrigan in the movie as well. Very cool looking Predator design. Um, lots of nice details with the skulls and everything. Just. Like a lot of the Predators in this movie, just really cool looking. I'll actually show you as well, just while I have on the big screen, that's the actual, the city hunter. So the feature Predator from Predator 2, you can see he's... Not, not to be confused with the Jackie Chan movie. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit different from the, the Predator design of the first movie. You can see the mask is different. He also has a more kind of um, almost tiger stripe design, but very very cool looking toy and very cool looking creature take a spear off there yeah so that's the one thing i do love about predator 2 is the actual creature designs they think they look really good stan winston done a bang up job i have um i have pretty much the entire crew of that predator ship i just have them in the cabinet but i only took out these two guys because they are kind of the feature players awesome so. i got the um Big, I don't have any of those little ones because they were kind of winding up when I started buying stuff, but I got the big Nicker one over in the corner and he has like the, he has that same tiger stripe pattern on his legs and that, and he's like the big 18 inch one. And he's, I've got, he's got unmasked and then I've got the one from the first period of film who has like a more pale fish, fishy sort of scaly skin and he's got the mask on. So I was happy to pick those ones up a few years ago. I love the close-ups we get of actually seeing just decent, um, you know, the Stan Winston studio's work on these Predators. They did so much world-building in this film. We're adding in not just the script, but, the, like, the visual stuff of seeing the weapons, the ship, the tribal hunter-gatherer sort of cultural aspects to them. They did so much in this film. We already know about the, you know, the weapons from the first film and some stuff, but seeing, like, a whole group of Predators, lots of sh- shots of them up close and out in the open and, like they just did so much amazing work with the you know creature effects on this. And they look like you know, I guess in in this movie as well, the the predator we're dealing with is a bit of a young blood. You know, he's kind of yeah. out to prove himself, and he's a little bit careless at times. Bit reckless, in, <laughs> yeah, reckless. And you kind of get the impression if it had been one of those more grizzled veteran predators we saw at the end of the movie, uh, you know, Harrigan may not have been so lucky <laughs> when it came to, to face yeah, them. Yeah, probably, <laughs> probably not. But yeah, just an absolutely beautiful work on like all the suits and the face and the scaly skin. It's amazing. And uh, yeah, and speaking of those suits, like they went to great lengths to give each predator their own unique look, their own unique design. 
even though you only see them for a couple of minutes at the end, um, yeah. you can look them all up. If you Google image, just the predator to lost tribe, you can look at individual pictures of, of kind of each of the predators, their, their mask designs and, and just everything else. It's just, it's phenomenal work that the, the studio did on, on designing these. Yeah, it's cool. Cause it shows that the, um, you know, they're traveling ships to different worlds and they all have taken trophies from different um, creatures and whatnot. So it helps explain their different unique looks. So how do you feel about Predator 2? Um, I, I, I love it. Like, I, feel, it. Didn't, I didn't see it. The first time I saw it would have been on TV. So I don't know how much they censored. Probably a fair bit of the blood and guts. But even if you censor every bit of blood in this film and the full dripping blood and you know we don't see so much close-ups of skinless people and this is as in the first film it's more kind of in the background and mid-ground um even if you sense all of that it's still a horrifically violent movie with all the gun violence of the shooting and everything else going on so you don't um there's not too much of a focus on gore like horror type gore in this one so even censored it's still an amazing film watching the tv network version so when you watch the full proper version on dvd or would have been laser disc back vhs and laser disc but later on dvd um you appreciate any little bits that were missing your swears are back in your gore's back in but the, the strength of the film was it's like a great action film it's a great visual effects and practical effects film and it does go for a different style than the first one i mean they're both they're both over the top but this one is more purposefully so over the top with the action and the style like robocop and detroit city you know it's 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 a little bit pastiche a little bit comic booky in that but and like the gangs like we're seeing plenty of movies with gang violence and we know it's definitely going it's it's the consequence of the violence is real but the some of the mannerisms you know they really played up for the film for fun in that and and i think it all works to the strength where it's just right in that middle ground where it's between serious film and grindhouse film and science fiction and it works really well like i, I love it so. yeah i love it and you know like i like i said uh, earlier i think it is a very underrated sequel um but i'd happily watch it i i me and my my wife would happily do uh the predator and predator 2 double bill um they just go nicely with each mm. other like the cast and is one excellent of those things, and Pro, 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 I, I don't know as far as um, audience expectations, but I'm guessing at the time, if you were going, if you were someone going to the cinema and not like me just being a kid seeing this on TV, you know, network TV for free and that, if you're going to the cinema, the lack of Arnold might have hurt it somewhat. If you were expecting him to be there or thinking of that, you know, so that can affect your perception of it. But on rewatches or years later, it's it's just an excellent film in its own right. I do think, um, at least initially in its opening week and weekend, it did do quite well at the box office. I assume and... it would have done fine because most movies are doing much better at the cinema back in the 90s compared to post 2000 when, you know, the box office went Something way else, down. I think maybe a week later or two weeks later, some big hit movie came out, which kind of like mm -hmm. smashed it off the, the charts. Yeah, there happens so... to a lot of good movies. <laughs> And sometimes it's just a, like a ordinary drama or something. It's like the biggest movie of the year, and you know. But uh, Stephen Hopkins, the guy who directed it, did a great job as well. He is. I'm really glad that Stephen Seagal was not in this. <laughs> yeah, big time. It's fuck Stephen Seagal. Oh well, some the of his only, movies. The only way I'd be happy if he was in it is if he died in the first five minutes. <laughs> Predator probably wouldn't kill Steven Seagal because, like, he'd do the heat scan of him and he's like, oh, his heart's already bad. And, look, he hasn't <laughs> even gotten up off the chair since I went into the room. He's trying to fight me yeah. doing Grave Maga lying on a chair. <laughs> he shit himself as soon as the Predator walked in the room. <laughs> but, you know, it's, but, yeah, it's one of those a potential things... actor in the running at some stage. Not for the lead, but, you know, for one of the B or C roles. There's one thing I'll say, and, you know, I've mentioned with other sequels we've talked about before i always like a sequel that will try and go in a different direction and mm. expand on what you've already done in the first movie and i have to say like this movie does kind of nail both those aspects we we take the action out of the jungle we put it in the urban jungle and we just go bigger and better we we learn more about the predator culture we get to see more predators um yeah, it's just it's awesome and we get to see them in a different environment. So I, 
I have to and say, if you do um, want an Arnold Predator Two this. story, you just need, need to go read the Dark Horse comic where you basically get that. Except they just make it as twin brother or whatever it is. Yeah. And if anybody is interested, if you if you just look up Predator Concrete Jungle, um, yeah, that's the one. Well, you'll get you'll get two returns back if you look that up. The the one you should be looking for is the actual comic book called Concrete Jungle by Dark Horse. But there was also a PS2 video game released called Predator Concrete yeah, Jungle, which is a yeah. totally different thing. It's actually a fun game, but it's got nothing to do mm. with anything that we're talking about. But you know, look, look up the comics, try and read them if you can, because they are fantastic. The, um, fun factoid: when I was looking up stuff this week, I was looking, I was watching videos retrospects on YouTube about all the different Alien Predator video games. Most of which I'm familiar with was, you know, when they came out the first time around. But um, that uh, PS2 game, the writing was by Grant Morrison. Yes. And he put a, quite a bunch of um, other, like, gangs and business characters and other stuff. So it's not bad to look up some of the long play and kind of cutscenes. So it's quite fun from that that game. But, yeah, that Concrete Jungle, um, the comic book is awesome, like, where you get the guy. I forget the name, but it's, like, Dutch's brother or something, and he's a cop in the city, and it's – Basically, very similar to this, but it's it's like you get an Arnold type character instead of Danny Glover in the comic. Yeah, you got you got Arnold instead of Danny Glover, and you got New York instead of LA. I yeah, guess those would be the the main. But difference. I think it complements it really well. To me, you can take Predator, Predator Two, and that comic, and they all kind of go together nicely. I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that definitely. I'm yeah, like now that been... Marvel's got the license to do the comics, that they'll reprint some of those Dark Horse ones that are out of print again. Yeah, because they are very expensive. I I saw what. Yeah, they've, they've done, done multiple the trades. They've done the omnibuses, and they've done like essential something else, and every version eventually sells out and goes up in price. And now they're out of out of print for several years again. Like way back in '07 or '08, when this Dark Horse first started printing the omnibuses, I I was looking. Yeah, that was to, great value. To pick them all up. Now they're very expensive. So mm. they did yeah. some another ones about three, four years ago, and new editions from from Dark Horse again that were like um, there were new omnibuses, but in different format and whatever, and they were really reasonably priced. And like an idiot, I thought oh, I'll get that next month, next month, next you know three years have gone by, <laughs> didn't get around to it, and you can't get them anymore. <laughs> it's always the way. But look, I we was still annoyed because I, I, in my mind, I was like, "Oh, that was twelve months ago." I looked up when it came out. No, that was three or four years ago that came out. Well, look, those of, of you who are, um, if you're willing to brave the high seas, you can get these things electronically. You know. Yeah, so, you sure can. You can get the whole dark horse run and find stuff online easy enough. And yeah, some, I, some I would of them reread stuff like that, but I'm always trying to track down physical editions of stuff where I can, but often it's out of print and we can't get it. And I'm like, well, I want to read it. <laughs> I'd also recommend a story. Um, it's a short story about how that elder predator actually gets his hands on the pistol, which he yeah, is that, in the pirate one? movie. That's right. It's the pirate one. I'm sure that's since been retconned because of that new prey movie that came Probably. out last year or whatever. But, um, who cares? Go look it up. You'll you'll enjoy it. Yeah, love that. Actually, I finally watched Prey last week. I hadn't seen it, which is what's that? That's which Predator Five. If you want to go to the numbers, and I was surprised how decent it was. I thought it was going to be yeah. garbage, but it's. I think it's the next best film after one and two. Yeah, I would go. I would probably go one, two Predators, then Prey for me. Mm -hmm. I I enjoyed Prey more than the Predator. I'll say that much. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, uh, I, I, no I, I enjoyed Rodriguez Predators. I predated Rodriguez when I saw that at the cinema it was good fun with old Adrian Brody. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I do have I do have some issues with the Rodriguez one, which we will we will wait yeah. till the day we actually tackle that <laughs> movie properly, and then I'll get into the nitty gritty about that. Yeah, we can come back to that. We do we go OG stuff first, and then we can get to like new and retcon and remakes and retro or whatever <laughs> although technically that you know period of the three takes place in the same timeline storyline it's not like a redo or anything but it's a modern film oh what else are we doing coming up on this here show oh yeah we're getting into real crazy town <laughs> kids think of an animal 
Have you thought of the animal? <laughs> okay, now we're going to mate it with a face hugger, and you're going to get a brand new xenomorph. Yeah, I was, I was reading some of the comics out of the night, and actually had quite a few of these animal things in them. Yeah, well, look, uh, you know, uh, the the xenomorph takes on the biological traits of the host organism. Yeah. So it makes and that's sense. my actual the um background one of the mantis alien that was on image I got online but the other three are all the actual toy toys i got in the recent recent weeks in the foreground yeah i'll try and dig out a few of my loose ones for next week so we can we can hold them up to the camera and go look look at this <laughs> what do you think of it jim harper you got your commentary on these weird aliens Jim Harper. Yeah. He's not just Jim Harper because this week he was actually probably one of those Jamaican voodoo guys. Well, he's a very Shit talented happens. guy. He plays a lot of characters. It's tough when you've got no skin. You've got to be Frank and Hellraiser and you've got to be Jim Harper and Predator. And But I guess you, you're this kind right of typecast here. if you've got no skin. See, folks, this is why racism is silly because we all <laughs> look like this on the inside. We all They're taste all just as delicious like barbecue yeah. for the predator. Uh, the beef jerky. Yeah, and one, one week's time, we're doing the Kenner Aliens toy line. And um, I will warn you, it's now up to 100 slides. So it will not be a short episode. Because <laughs> I've got the entire you know I've got the entire Aliens toy line. And there's a couple of predators pop up. But we, we will come back to the actual predator version. Because it's like two toy lines and one where it kind of spills over into other stuff. And the following week, we've got some other stuff to talk about. Um, we'll talk about some more toy things, but we've also got Mark's done some cool videos of his NECA Predator collection, the NECA Aliens collection. So we've got them saved or, or ready to, they're all ready to go during like those shows and that, as well as we'll play some of those during the Alien one as well. But I thought, yeah, we can do like a super show, talk about that whole kind of 90s. Um, we've got Terminator, we've got Robocop, we've got Aliens Predator. Your toy stuff, your comics, we've got films, but yeah, we can just like go where we want to and get into these topics as well as still do individual episodes on other full movies and whatever down the line. I'm sure everyone wants to see Robocop 3, they're just hanging out for that one. Oh, yeah, they're just dying for us to got do Robocop Kruger from three. Industrial Smelting, George's boss in Seinfeld's and Robocop 3. Yeah, folks, we're on the march to the big 50, not long to go now. And uh, each week just keeps getting better and better for me. Anyway, I just love talking about this yeah. stuff. I just like uh, seeing some carnage. <laughs> yeah. Do you know where I got that quote Mars. from? <laughs> I'm guessing The Running Man, is it? Uh, well, the video the game that's from. based on The Running Man. <laughs> oh, <right>. Smash TV. <laughs> yeah, The Running Man someday. We'll have to, yeah. we'll have to tackle that. And the exploding heads from like the best exploding head film ever, like Scanners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love scanners, but yeah, I just thought, what's some carnage I could put in some guts to go with all these films? I've got full of guts and stuff, and I thought, gotta put that in. <laughs> well, look, it's wholesome family entertainment based yeah. on R rated movies, boys and girls, children of all ages, but don't actually show <laughs> it to your children. We don't take any responsibility. It's funny, I'd really enjoy that stuff, even like the hokey. Marvel Comics Robocop that was based on the uh, animated series. It's, I don't know, it's it's not, I wouldn't say it's a good comic, but I still enjoy it <laughs> for what it is. Yeah. Oh, look, we'll always, you always find some good in this stuff. But so, yeah, that's uh, it for this, uh, this week. Predator 2, classic kick ass action slash sci fi film. Old Denny Glover. Yeah. Go watch it, folks. It's good fun. Of of all the number twos you could do, it ain't the worst. Definitely not. One of the good ones. Okay, thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you over the next time. Take care, folks.